Donal O'Mahuna from Dublin City University in Ireland, and um, I'm the, the chair of uh, this cost action, uh, which is a, an EU funded uh, mechanism to allow people to gather together to discuss topics and issues that uh, maybe have not been high on uh, research agendas or other funding mechanisms in the past. So um, it's, uh, it's really great to be here in, uh, in Budapest. Um, we uh, just want to really thank uh, the people uh, here in Budapest who have been organizing it, so the uh, Central European University, uh, to uh, our own Peter, and uh, the University of Debrecen, and C-Lab uh, as well for all the work that has gone on uh, prior to this to get everything uh, together and, and organized. Um, we uh, are going to have uh, two talks this morning, and uh, Professor Thomas Paga is scheduled in about 20 minutes, and uh, if he shows up, uh, then uh, we, will, uh, we will hear him, and if not, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll have a, a plan B in place by that time. Um, but, uh, but with that, I just want to um, get things rolling, and I'll turn it over to Peter, and uh, uh, thank you all for coming, and I really look forward to chatting with, uh, with all of you in the next couple of days. Yeah, thank you, Donal. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Peter Kokuk. Uh, I work at the University of uh, Debrecen, the Faculty of Public Health. And uh, thanks, Donal, for uh, letting us organize this event. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm research associate uh, at the Center for Ethics and Law in Biomedicine, which is uh, established by uh, uh, Professor Judith Chandor here at the Central European University. And I'm very happy that we can have this event because now C-Lab has a 10th year uh, anniversary and we are celebrating it the whole year. I hope it will be a very happy year. Uh, and uh, after just uh, welcoming you, uh, I would like to uh, tell you some technicalities uh, and practicalities related to the conference. Uh, we have some uh, uh, pro problem with the keynotes, but probably we will uh, solve it. We uh, have uh, Professor uh, uh, Nenad Dimitrievich, uh, uh, who uh, would be uh, having the first keynote. Uh, regarding the walking tour, uh, after the conference we have a walking tour, those who are registered, we will meet uh, at the corner of the universities here at the main entrance, and we will finish 30 minutes before dinner uh, at the Palace of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. It will be a really interesting guided tour, uh, and uh, the dinner is very close to the uh, 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 palace. It's 200 meters, it's a, it's a ship on, a, on the Danube, but you uh, all have this info, uh, this conference venue info paper, you have the Wi-Fi password and ATM things and the maps and everything, but uh, in any case, if you have some questions, do not hesitate to uh, ask me or our, my our, uh, colleagues. And to finish it, I would like to thank Judith that we uh, do this uh, event. I think it's really relevant both for CLAB uh, and both for CEU mission uh, uh, generally. But before we do that, remember, for those of you who are familiar, we have to do our signature pages. Um, so there was a, um, a, an attendance sheet that you checked off at the door, but there's also the official uh, cost signature yeah, page. So, um, could you show it up on it? Thank so <laughs> anybody who is not a member of our group who's uh, come along for the talks this morning or whatever, you also should sign in as well because uh, the higher attendance numbers uh, makes us look good and shows that <laughs> we have really been engaging with people outside of our own, uh, our own club. Um, so, uh, so please do uh, sign in there um, and you have to sign in both days um, on the sheet. Yes, thank you. It is really important information. Actually, it was the most important one. That's why I forgot it. So uh, let me introduce you, uh, Professor Judith Chandler, who will uh, give our, us uh, the first introductory uh, talk on disaster and ethics. Um, thank you very much for the generous introduction. I also have to say that I'm very happy that we can have uh, this event here. So ladies and gentlemen, participants of the Cost Action Project, CU faculty members, students and guests, 
welcome to the Central European University that has recently celebrated the 25th anniversary of its foundation with approximately 1,400 students and 370 faculty members from more than 130 countries. CU is one of the most culturally diverse and international universities in the world. Its rare mix of ethnic and national background creates an ideal environment for examining such as open society subject as emerging democracy and transitional uh, economies, nationalism, media freedom, human rights, and the rule of law. When we established the Center for Ethics and Law in Biomedicine, you can see the small red logo on your uh, folder in 2005, with the intention to foster multidisciplinary research in the field of bioethics and human rights and to develop a network of scholars coming from different disciplines such as anthropology, philosophy, gender studies, bioethics and law, we have completed successful, successful partly European-funded uh, EU project in the field of protecting genetic data and regulating biobanks, organ donation and tissue trafficking, stem cell research and nanotechnology, the public understanding of genetics and the promotion of advances in neuroenhancement, but we have not done yet research on disaster ethics. Therefore, I'm very grateful for the COST uh, project as hosting this conference, which offers us an excellent opportunity to discuss this important new field of bioethics. I have to admit that I'm not an expert in the field of disaster ethics, similarly to those many uh, scholars and students in the audience who have just come to learn from your experience, which you have completed uh, your research-based activities. And um, we also have come here to learn from you for the next uh, two days. Thus, in the following 25 minutes, I would like to share just some very preliminary thoughts with you from a very, uh, as a kind of uh, outsider's perspective to warm you up for the real rigorous and research-based contributions. Uh, here I have to give a personal statement. When I was a law student many years ago, uh, one of the first legal expression that we learned at the law school was vis major, which means of a superior force originally referring to an act of a god. Vis major occurs, for example, in cases of hurricane, tornado, earthquake, and a natural disaster which develop without the interventions of human beings. This legal approach considers disasters as rare events in which ordinary responsibility and legal liability do not apply, usually because of the lack of fault and causation. Um, so why disaster challenge or moral and legal um, consensus? I think that there are many interesting definitions which I am sure that you come across. But now, when I was asked uh, to speak something about as introductory thoughts uh, for this event by Peter Kakuk, uh, my colleague who organized this conference with us, I had to re-examine my previous legal education and compare my uh, experience after the law school uh, about natural disasters and disasters that caused hu by humans. And I had to realize one thing. Uh, I had to realize that even in my lifetime, in a relatively safe Carpathian basin, I have witnessed many disasters, smaller and bigger, and just 300 kilometers from us, a terrible war in Yugoslavia in my lifetime. Um, so um, disasters are not as rare events and not as extraordinary as I thought when I was a 20-year-old law student. Disasters are with us and shape our lives. I would like to share some of my thoughts related to disasters and disaster management in the region and discuss them from ethical and legal and broader political perspectives. On the April 26, 1986, I was enjoying the sunny weather while studying on the balcony on my parent, of my parents' house. No one warned us about the nuclear catastrophe and no one thought to cancel the upcoming parade to be held on the 1st of May. No one told poor pensioners not to buy cheap cabbage on the open air vegetable market. 
The explosion at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant released large quantities of radioactive particles into the atmosphere, which spread over much of the western part of Soviet Union and northern Europe. There is still no official assessment of how many people have come ill with the cancer in the region as a result of nuclear catastrophe. One of the central myths that they were promoted by the state socialist countries uh, was that communist system could not fail because of its hyper-realism that preempts damage of human error. This was one reason why general public didn't learn about the disaster in time and was not warned about the consequences. Censorship also reinforced this aura of secrecy in 1985. One year before the accident, Anatoly Mayoretz, the Minister of Energy, issued a decree, even one year before the catastrophe, that information of any adverse effects caused by functioning of the energy industry on employees, inhabitants, and environment were not suitable for publication by newspapers, radio, or television. So, even uh, the official learned about the gravity of disaster within the next few days. They still didn't want, want to cancel the annual May Day parades held in Kiev and Minsk to pretend that everything was normal. Those politicians and bureaucrats who knew about the seriousness of the situation relocated, uh, nevertheless, their children from Kiev and from other uh, threatened areas immediately after the accident. But many people, including the so-called group of liquidators, those who had to have the cleaning uh, jobs, perished without having offered adequate protection uh, to them. A week after the Chernobyl tragedy, all children's playground in the town of uh, Wiesbaden, this is south western part of Germany were closed due to the level of radiation. The Chernobyl disaster clearly indicated the contrast between the ways people were treated in the Soviet regime and in the western democracies. Some argue that the way the disaster was handled by the Soviet Union and in the state socialist countries contributed greatly to the increase of distrust in the political system and paved the way to the eventual collapse of communist regimes. In the uh, multi-party system of new democracies, such as Hungary, uh, there are some kind of uh, other issues later on after the political transition. And this is what I call the role of political polarization, which may present another distorting uh, element in disaster management. Instead of the society-wide response based on solidarity and community action, the governing party intends to benefit from the disasters by showing its capacity to save the lives and properties of people and blaming the previous governments for their negligence, while political opposition seeks to prove the incompetence the government in disaster management. Uh, we had, for instance, the uh, Sianid spill to the River Tissa and a couple of other uh, very um, uh, difficult events and very sad events, for instance, the Red Sludge spill in Western Hungary, which occurred in October 2010. Thus, one cannot agree more with Bruce Jennings and John Arras, who said that disasters tend to highlight and exacerbate the deep social fissures and chronic social injustices that haunt a society. Shortcomings in emergency preparedness and response are often a function of pre-existing inadequacies in the public health infrastructure and in other services. When we turn to Hungary again, two recent events can be mentioned in contrast with both cases of natural disasters uh, gave reasons for opposing political parties to blame each other for uh, the mismanagement. Both events, uh, strangely enough, so it will be a short history lessons for you who first time come to Hungary, because both of them occurred on national holidays. Um, and which only increased the political overtones of the disaster management. Um, one was on 20th of August on 2006. Uh, the other was uh, March 15 in 2013. 
The August 20, for, for you who are not familiar with the Hungarian uh, history, is the celebration of the Hungarian statehood and the crowning of St. Stephen. The cathedral is not far from the university, probably you have seen him while coming here. As the first Christian king of the country, uh, the end of the official programs every year annually um, is uh, when thousands uh, of tens of thousands of visitors coming to Budapest is uh, fireworks during the night. And in 2006, people were also preparing for the spectacle. Actually, it's a very popular event. People come here and, and uh, also occupy the bank of the river for waiting for the night show of the fireworks. And uh, it followed by um, what happened is that they uh, were waiting on both sides and the show started, but then storm developed with an unexpected force and the tornado struck down Budapest. Um, so it was followed by a hailstorm, which made already frightened people panic and four people even died in the stampede. In the lack of preparedness and proper disaster management, as well as in the lack of solidarity and community action, many more people suffered physical and emotional injuries than the situation would otherwise induce. As a result of the shock and experience of disaster mismanagement, the ruling socialist government suffered a setback in popularity that it has never been able to uh, regain afterwards. Uh, another national holiday is the 15th of March, is another important, again, just to familiarize you with our history, is the day when we celebrate, and it's important to understand the relevance of this other disaster, commemorate the 1848 revolution, which pursued Hungarian uh, independence from the Habsburg Empire. Part of the political transition, tradition is to hold polarizing speeches on all sides of the political spectrum, and this day usually is an important occasion for opposition parties to promote their political alternatives. Such was the case in 2013 as well, but unexpectedly a, a strong snowstorm blanketed half of the country a day before, and thousands of people were stuck in their freezing cars overnight, waiting for the rescue on all along the highways. Disaster management failed miserably again, and Hungarian authorities were unprepared for such a dramatic snowstorm. Moreover, they were not willing to accept the Austrian help immediately, delaying the organized rescue operations. As you see that at the end, the Austrian rescue uh, operations has started. The Ministry of Interior was ridiculed for sending SMS messages to all Hungarian mobile phone numbers, irrespective of their location. So even those who actually were abroad, they got a following message. Turn, um, turn out um, uh, the message contained that if you are frozen in your car, just sit in a car next to you. As it turned out, the disaster mismanagement of authorities were contrasted with altruistic civilian assistance. People stuck in their cars could receive food, shelter, and transport offered by their fellow citizens, avoiding possible casualties. And uh, last year, which is well more known, perhaps the refugee crisis brought about similar response while official humanitarian aid and organized disaster management was severely delayed or even denied, was left to the creativity and ingenuity, empathy and solidarity of ordinary citizens, doctors and social workers and volunteer their assistance to refugees and being stuck at the Kalati railway station for several weeks. And while these citizens were doing what the authorities should have done, uh, they were officially condemned by the government for their intervention. Now I would like to uh, say some um, other types of examples uh, which uh, shows of another approach of disaster management of different type of society when the solidarity works uh, somewhat differently. And it seems 
um, to me that the long-standing mentality and political culture influence the society's attitude and reactions to disasters. There are countries where solidarity and well-organized community action can handle extreme challenges. One of the countries which constantly face extreme challenges, a uh, country which I visited this year, is Iceland, and I was impressed by learning how Icelanders have coped with series of vehement volcanic eruptions over their course of the history. And one of the events which moved me the most was the to learn from of an older experience. Actually, I've seen a film and, and I've seen a location uh, of a devastating volcanic eruption on the small island of Hamy that occurred in 1973. The Altfeld volcano erupted unexpectedly during the night, but still everyone was rescued. The rescue team did not only save people on the island, but also managed to safeguard the major source of the income, which was the harbor. They had a slogan, the city without a harbor is not a city, and they have to uh, also protect their income. And there's a wonderful uh, movie and a book about uh, also telling this story. They did something uh, of which seems to be hopeless, they wanted to cool down the lava. With a Niagara quantity of water, try to cool down the lava in order to save their harbor. The heroic and seemingly hopeless fight against the volcanic lava was also successful. It could be cooled down and the natural uh, material outflow was later used for construction purposes. So actually they also had benefits from this terrible uh, incident. Um, the other example is the well-known uh, example, which is more complex, but I would like to just mention of an innovative element, which is also important in my view, is uh, apart from following the protocols of uh, disaster management to use human creativity and uh, solidarity, was Japan. Uh, where, of course, there are numerous examples, but it's uh, in generally a country where a well-organized society living under frequent threat of natural disasters. After the devastating so-called triple tragedy of earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear leak uh, at Fukushima plant, the reaction of Japanese officials was a mixture of controlled relocation, immediate allocation to aid the affected area. But um, uh, what I uh, was very much uh, uh, appreciated is the also offering a psychological remedy to the lonely elderly victims in the forms of providing them uh, baby uh, seal robots. They were capable of encouraging them uh, by uh, facial uh, mimics. And I think this kind of uh, very creative uh, solution is also uh, shows that we have to looking at all aspects of a disaster. So uh, just to um, wrap it up, we can see that societies, uh, the structure of society has a key point in looking how disaster is managed, apart how the guild system is working in a society, and the challenges and the characteristics on the societies of well circumcised society, in a case when uh, the uh, disaster uh, makes some kind of disruption in contrast with a society when double, they call double disaster in the literature when they're also, um, the society is uh, polarized, there are people who had an extreme vulnerable position. Uh, for instance, the uh, tsunami victims are often labeled uh, as uh, in, in this third category, and you see what are the human rights challenges and what are the characteristics differs from of, uh, these um, different categories. For instance, of the uh, double disaster uh, shows that we need to have a longer term human rights observation even uh, long after the uh, accident. Uh, for instance, um, uh, when uh, organ traffickers appear in the scene uh, where the victims already suffered of um, the, the natural disaster and they lost their uh, dwelling place and they are uh, exploited. They suffer of a multiple exploitation. This is, for instance, which has been observed after the tsunami victims in some places, or the double standards. We know, for instance, the DNA identification of the victims were not offered uh, in the same degree for uh, the local victims, but uh, of course a lot of Western groups wanted to identify their relatives after the, uh, uh, the disaster, but it was not offered similarly to the local victims. And um, 
So we see that it needs of a kind of longer term observation um, and um, uh, disaster tend to highlight uh, these kind of social uh, fissures and we have to be aware when we are preparing a disaster management. Also, the, another type of double vulnerability after Haiti earthquake, the child trafficking issues, a high number of reported cases of the uh, children which were trafficked from uh, the scenes of the Haiti earthquake. So um, we see that ethical and legal responsibility uh, should be assessed both uh, before the accident. I didn't speak so much about the preparedness and monitoring. I'm sure that many experts in this field will uh, tackle this issue in the next coming two days. But of course, there are significant literature on access um, uh, the services and also ethical legal responsibilities during um, the uh, disaster. But I think that uh, we human rights lawyer, we should also, and bioethicists should think about in the longer term, so what happens after that uh, rehabilitation on also uh, trauma, how to deal and, and how to eliminate in the long run the harm. And these are the, uh, of course, there are many other ethical issues and this is what can go wrong in, in different fields. So this is the ethical failures and the legal responsibilities before, uh, during, and after the uh, natural uh, disasters. Uh, the role of political culture is also uh, very important. So what works in one country, I, I was very much impressed in the US to see of different manuals of disaster, even choking protocols, and, and it's very much strategic. While in, in Hungary, uh, there is a kind of skepticism also, we had a well-known proverb coming from the literature when an official person states that there is no problem and everyone should stay calm, then triggers a public panic among the public. Um, so the actions, there are numerous um, actions for disaster laws. I, I was completely impressed to see in different fields of disaster how well it's developed, but I, what I wanted to argue in addition to these uh, logistics that there is uh, from these examples, we may draw that conclusion that in case of disaster, humanitarian principles should have a priority over administrative rules motivated by political intention. Interestingly, in societies where people experience a, and exercise solidarity, they also have creative and innovative solutions in crisis management. The, the robots which I showed from Japan or the cooling the lava, and there are several other uh, innovative solutions as the Icelander called it jokingly, the pisa, the hraunit, the pissing on the lava, and offering robot toys for lonely senior victims of natural disasters in Japan show that community action and humanitarian aid should include also creative responses to the crisis inflicted by natural and non-natural disaster. The law in itself, therefore, cannot prepare the various municipal and administrative institutions and the people in general for the management of all kind of aspects of disaster management coming by, and it's unable to guide all the actions necessary to elevate the damage done. The law can, however, help allocating responsibilities, organizing and structuring actions, but there will be always a room for creativity, solidarity, and altruistic human community action to fill in the gaps of the law. Um, therefore, I'm very curious to learn from you, and I wish you a very successful two days, lively debates, intellectual delight, and a pleasant state at CU with us, with Salab, and in Hungary. Thank you very much for your attention.